Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to meet you again after what I imagine has been a full day for all of you. Now, to conclude this first day at WISE, welcome to a session that recognizes and celebrates innovation in education. We're honored today to have one of the pioneers in education in the media with us. For 50 years, Sesame Workshop has been working to make education inclusive and accessible. Please welcome on stage President of Social Impact and Philanthropy at Sesame Workshop, Sherry Weston. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Yara. Thank you, Her Highness, Stavros, and the entire WISE team, indeed a very WISE team, for this wonderful opportunity to be here today to help celebrate the 50th anniversary of Sesame Street. It's truly such an honor. So 50 years ago, it was audacious philanthropy that made Sesame Street possible, with funding from the Ford Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation. Because you see, Sesame Street started out as an experiment to see if television could teach young children. And more specifically, could it give less advantaged children an opportunity to arrive at school ready to learn because we had provided access to early education. And it worked. So um, when Sesame Street debuted, there were a million and a half children who were watching. This was more than the number of children who were in preschool at the time, and it was to measurable results. Since then, there have been over 1,000 studies on the impact of Sesame Street. But I also love the fact that our founders thought they were creating the quintessential American show. It was the first multiracial cast. It was on a stoop in Harlem in New York City. But they soon found out that the appeal of these Muppets was universal. Within a year, Germany, Mexico, and Brazil all came to us saying they wanted their own adaptations of Sesame Street. So today, Sesame Street is delivering educational content to children in 150 countries. We'd like to think that we have now become, thank you. Um, we like to think we've now become the longest street in the world. So we've taken our proven model to reach and teach children around the globe, many of whom have no access to quality early in education in countries like Afghanistan, India, Bangladesh, and it's not just letters and numbers that we teach. We have always had a whole child curriculum, and that means we also focus on not just the academic basics, but the social and emotional needs that we know children need to thrive. And we have had meaningful results. I, I wanna share just one example. Um, in a recent 15-country meta-analysis, the results of the research showed that children who watched local adaptations of Sesame Street had a 12 percentile learning gain. And what's important there is that's the equivalent of traditional preschool, but at a fraction of the cost and at scale. And that's the power of media and Muppets. So our mission is to help children everywhere grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. And it sounds like a very clever tagline, but we mean it. It's smarter in terms of literacy, numeracy, stronger in terms of resilience and health and well-being, and kinder in terms of the fact we model empathy, understanding, respect for differences. And we're reaching children in those critical early years. Um, we know 
that a child's brain development is the most in the first five years of life, and it's where we can have the greatest return on investment. We also know from the neuroscience that when a child experiences traumatic events during those critical early years, it literally debilitates brain development with lifelong consequences that can help affect not only their learning, but also their health and well-being. So to help mitigate the impact on children's development, Sesame has had a long history of tackling very tough issues, always from the lens of a child. Now perhaps one of the most powerful examples of this is the work that we're doing in the refugee space. There's no doubt that the global refugee crisis is one of the most defining humanitarian challenges of our time. And as you can see on the slide, today almost 71 million people are, are displaced, almost half of whom are children. And yet, less than 3% of all humanitarian aid goes to education. And I might add, only a tiny sliver of that goes to early education. So we knew at Sesame that we had a role to play, but we also knew we couldn't do it alone. And that's what led to our partnership with the International Rescue Committee, the IRC, because we needed a direct service partner who knew as much about the needs of refugees as we know about the needs of young children. And thanks to the incredible support about two years ago from the MacArthur Foundation, Together, the IRC and Sesame are creating the largest early childhood intervention in the history of humanitarian response. Now the success of this effort will depend on creating replicable, proven, scalable models. And our hope, and that of MacArthur's, was that this investment would be a catalyst for others to step up to help truly transform humanitarian response to make sure that we're including the youngest. And I am thrilled to say that in less than one calendar year, the Lego Foundation did just that. They were inspired by MacArthur, and they made an equally audacious commitment to help expand this initiative to reach Bangladesh and those affected by the Rohingya crisis. So there we are bringing playful learning, nurturing care to millions of refugee children. Now in Bangladesh, we will partner with an organization called BRAC, um, BRAC is actually the world's largest NGO in terms of employees, and they have tremendous experience on the ground in Bangladesh, and particularly with the Rohingya communities. And I think this speaks to another really important factor um, in terms of success when scaling, is when organizations partner with others who have complementary skill sets, we are so much stronger together. And one other critical partner I want to mention is NYU Global Ties, and they are our research partner. Um, I have to say that there is a dearth of research on what's most effective in helping children in crisis settings. And with the investment in NYU, by doing independent evaluations of this initiative and sharing it with the world, we will literally double the amount of research available because we want others to learn from what we learn, to learn from what works and what doesn't work so that they're in a position that they can more easily adapt this and these models to take them to scale to reach children um, wherever they may be. So before I close, I want to share just a little bit about this initiative in the Syrian response region. It's called Ahlan Simpson. I think many of you in the, this room will recognize that that means welcome Sesame in Arabic. And as it's everything we do at Sesame Workshop, we start with research, and this was certainly no exception. We conducted formative research, needs assessments, held advisories, and always, always bring in local experts. And what we learned was that children in the region, both displaced and host communities, were in huge need of support in building out the social emotional skills. And particularly, they needed help in identifying emotions and managing emotions. This is something that's especially important for children who've experienced trauma. So in addition to direct services, and you know, we'll reach children through home visits, through learning centers, healthcare centers, but a critical component, of course, because it's Sesame, will also be an all new, uh, locally produced Arabic version of Sesame Street. And this will be distributed to children and families through television, through digital, through mobile. Um, 
and the show will focus on those emotional ABCs. And we will feature new Muppet characters with storylines that children can relate to. For instance, you can see up on the screen the little orange guy. Um, this is a young boy named Jad, and Jad had to leave his home. Now the other is a gregarious little purple Muppet. Her name is Basma, and what's very important is she is Jad's new best friend, and she welcomed Jad to the Alham Simpson neighborhood with open arms. So we know from our experience around the world that these characters have the power to become very powerful role models for children, giving them storylines and um, characters that children can relate to, feeling less alone, and modeling important things like inclusion, acceptance, and understanding, and very importantly, respect for differences. So I am thrilled to say that today, Basma has come all the way from Ahlan Simpson to be here with us at the Wise Forum. So I would like to welcome Basma. <laughs> Hi, Basma. Hello, Mr. I know, I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> wow, there's so many people. Hi, everybody. I know, we are so, we are so excited you're here, Basma. We're kind of known for making friends where I come from. I know, and I was just telling everybody about Ahan Simpson. Oh, it's the perfect name. <laughs> My neighborhood is the most welcoming place in the whole world. <laughs> well, and don't you have a new best friend, Basma? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. His name is Chad. Our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And do you have a lot in common? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> um, in some ways, we're not alike. I have purple fur, and right. Jad has yellow fur. I like the same. Ahlan Simpson. And Jad loves to paint. But mm. we both love to go on adventures together. <laughs> well, that sounds great. But didn't you tell me that when he first came to Alan Simpson, he was a little sad? Oh, it was Miss Sherry, because he didn't know anyone at first. But we did everything we could to oh. help him feel welcome. Now, it's like we've known him forever. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. But I'm sure you and your friends will help him if he starts to miss his old friends or get sad again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We did miss Sherry. We learned about big feelings. Right. That's when you feel oh, sad or <laughs> afraid or <laughs> angry. And you don't know what to do. So we learned some special ways okay. to feel better. Uh -huh. Things like turning to five, or my favorite, <laughs> belly breathing. Wait, belly breathing? Yeah. Can, can you tell us about belly breathing? <gasps> I will show you. Do you want to try it with me? Yes. Yeah, everybody, put your hands on your belly. Okay. Like me. And everybody. breathe in. Breathe out. <sighs> It does again. help. Again, again. <laughs> Breathe in. <sighs> Breathe out. <laughs> it helps you to calm down nice and slow. Well, I think that is fantastic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love that you are teaching these wonderful coping strategies. Oh. And I know you and Jad will have many other wonderful adventures. But <laughs> thank you so much for coming to see us today. Oh, thanks, Miss Cherry. <laughs> So, I will say my goodbyes. <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Shay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, Basma. <laughs> and thank all of you. <laughs> I don't know. That was great. That was great.
Thank you so much, Sherry, and of course, thank you, Basma, hiding in there. Um, and of course, congratulations on 50 years of Sesame Street. Now, speaking of celebrations, it's time to celebrate our 2019 WISE Awards. Every year since 2009, the WISE Awards recognize and promote innovative projects that are addressing global educational challenges. This year's group of six winning projects will join a growing community of education innovators from a wide variety of sectors and locations. Let's discover how these projects are tackling a number of pressing educational issues. Criança Feliz ele foi criado em função das descobertas científicas. Quando se descobriu a importância que tem, o impacto que tem, políticas públicas, o acompanhamento dos primeiros anos de vida, nos obrigou a buscar uma forma de criar um programa efetivo para esse desenvolvimento. Temos um exército de 22 mil profissionais que são contratados e estão indo até as casas estimular, apoiar a família, investir nos primeiros anos de vida, porque você tem condições de colocar as crianças num nível de maior igualdade social. Tava, antes de eu entrar no Criança Feliz, eu estava ficando afastada dos meus filhos por certas situações e quando eu entrei no Criança Feliz, eles me aproximaram mais ainda deles. Eu aprendi a amar mais meus filhos e é isso. A não afetividade dos pais já vem de uma criação passada e eles precisam sim aprender através de uma comunicação básica de apoio como a nossa. É, eu levo o conhecimento adequado conforme a idade da criança, é fazer com que essas famílias é, tenham um novo método de vida até. O benefício desse programa para mim e para minha família, que eu estou vendo aqui, é o comportamento dos meus filhos. Elas estão aprendendo a reconhecer cores, a coordenação motora delas, a percepção delas está melhorando muito. Aí, no caso, nós já ensinam, a orientadora vem, ensina para nós, nós passamos para eles esse ensinamento. Family Business for Education is a concept where social workers identify street-connected uh, kids and then caregivers receive livelihood support package that they use to generate income so that children can stay in school. Up and street child training, let me show you how for sell, how for talk to customers there, whether I will get young so that and then and let go make now the business look go. We as business officers visit these families once a week 
collect 60 cents from them every week, which will give them a mindset of saving. The idea behind this is to put this money into education for the children. Well, more than give me my mother's money, I'll be the one as school end with them now. My mother is sacrificed for it and don't do more efforts for it. They say they give me for sure love to them. They blow to them, they love to them, they encourage them. And so what they tell them, that's so what they do. I mean, they do. Spiritual really help these men and women to become agents of their own change and lay the emphasis on caring for the children. We work from outset with communities and we work with local government and we work with our on the ground team, our education managers and our education officers to bring together people who are all committed to one single purpose which is to establish and run a community school for however many out of school children there may be in this village. Once the school is complete and open, we identify the schools of a committee. They are the people who maintain the school, who will make sure the school is running with full of children, and the schools of a committee identify the community teachers. I became a teacher because I care about the education in Cambodia. My role is to train the EO, and EO cascade the training to community teacher and I support him to do the training with the government teacher to meet the standard of Cambodian national curriculum. I the When we build a school here, we're looking for a partner school anywhere in the world to raise the money to support our school here. Okay, Empowerment of local people is absolutely at the core of everything we do. We train local people and we give them the skills to take their own schools forward in the best way for their community. started work on the issue of child sexual abuse uh, about 13 years ago. We found that there was hardly any work happening in the space of prevention. We also understood that working with children is the most critical part of prevention, so that they can understand differences between safe and unsafe touches, understand which are their private body parts, if such a thing happens, what are they supposed to do, and who can they reach out to help. I have learned that 
if somebody tries to touch see or look my private body parts can prevent by saying no and get away from there i learned uh, how to express feelings everyone has the right to express feelings it's not only a lecture method it's usually discussion we have role plays sometimes we do it through emoticons and flash cards for private body parts we do it using charts so it's a very interactive method so that they are appropriately able to use the information that we teach them in classrooms after the classroom lesson plans happen the trainer starts meeting the children one on one and gives us the opportunity to ask them if there's any abuse that the child has experienced in cases of ongoing child sexual abuse we make sure that a counselor meets the child within 24 hours the effect has been quite positive over 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 the years realizing the fact that they are special they are unique makes them more confident i would say every parent should take up this particular course it bridges that gap between a parent and a child i mean when my child first came home and said uh, that they were taught to respect their body it was a real innovative uh, thing to hear The academic model combines education for sustainable development with 21 century skills, personalized learning, innovation and ethical leadership so that students graduate prepared for the careers of today and the future. We aligned our academic model to the Rwandan government's vision of becoming a regional hub for innovation, technology and ecotourism. At Aquila, it is student-centered, and the instructor is just there to facilitate. The students are in groups, they do pair activities, and later they come and present their findings. Our education is not just coming to school, it's life-changing. Every instructor, every person in Aquila community is willing to see you growing. I was inspired to start my own company from the compliment our instructor gave me to promote women in tourism and to create a big, big, big impact in the community. Apart from the Aquila instructors, we have careers team that is in charge of career development and the helpers in civil writing, preparing for interviews, looking for internships to build a career path that are really helpful. financial and academic models are designed to be affordable so that we can rapidly scale to new markets. Our blended learning model serves students who wouldn't otherwise be in higher ed. I'm very proud to be an Aquila alumni because uh, I feel responsible from where I am to really work hard as an empowered lady. My trooper is 
cool. Educational fun. Extraordinary. We think that physical computing are key for broadening participation. Getting hands on with technology and taking it away from the screen allows you to provide context and real world solutions so that children can get really engaged. I was so excited to take microbits into the classroom and as a teacher I was really learning alongside the pupils and it's an excellent foundation for one day to physically code because they're beginning with building blocks which just fit together like jigsaws. The microbit is really cool because you can try different things on it. I'm going to make the microbit show a smiley face. Then we go into input. So now we need to put the code from the computer onto the micro bit and we do that by pressing the download button. Now that the code is downloaded, I'm going to press button A and here is my smiley face. The idea was that we would provide a micro bit free to every 11 and 12 year old in the UK. So what we did was convene a major partnership of lots of different organisations, ranging from Microsoft to Samsung, people that were very interested in coding and promoting computer science skills with children. People have step counters, but um, they just buy one from the store. But because I have a micro bit, I can make one of my own. The micro bit is scalable and easily replicable around the world because it's low cost, it's small, and it's easy for children everywhere to get their hands on it and to take their first steps with coding. You could use coding to create a robot, maybe. You just need to let your imagination grow wild. What extraordinary stories there. Please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome these remarkable people onto the stage. So I'd like to begin by introducing uh, Minister Osmar Terra. He's the Minister of Citizenship in Brazil from Programa Crianza Feliz. And I'll just uh, remind the audience uh, that the minister will be speaking in Spanish, so if you can please put your headsets on. Uh, minister, I'll give you this. Um, we saw the extraordinary work uh, that's been done there. Just tell us what inspired you to do what you did. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, this uh, opportunity because it's uh, really very motivating to receive uh, this uh, prize. So thank you to Her Highness uh, for her generosity and for giving us the opportunity to be here. Also, I'd like to say that my source of inspiration is as follows. I've worked for over 35 years in public policy. I am a doctor by qualification, I'm an expert in neuroscience, so I always try to search for empirical evidence to see which public policy could actually change the world and be helpful to everybody. And that's how I got to education, quality education for all. That's the most transformational issue. That's what will enable children to thrive. But for us to provide quality education to a poor child, 
side. That's the question we all have to try to answer. And that's what inspired me to implement this program. We're going to reach uh, almost a million people by the end of the year. I had the support of the First Lady, Ms. Bolsonaro, who is a big supporter of our program. And we have the support of the team, Elisa Razawa. We have the support of Mary Ann, who is uh, helping us here as well from China. And we had the opportunity to look for mosaics, for artists, for scientists within every child that is born. Every child has the potential to become exceptional. But from the moment uh, they are conceived, up to the moment when they grow up, we have to think that there are a thousand days, the first thousand days in the life of a child, which are going to make the difference for the rest of their life. So we have to focus on those early stages to make sure that they can develop, that they can turn into a Mozart, into an artist, a painter. Those talents will be wasted if families do not count on the support by governments, if they have no one to teach them how to develop that talent. That's why we partner with uh, CBC, that that's why we partner with UNICEF as well, and uh, we are constantly monitoring and assessing our program. In Brazil, uh, for us, it's very motivating to receive this award. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll come to you now, uh, Megan, uh, because we saw you're from Family Business for Education. What was a defining moment for you? Well, what I want to say about Street Child's Family Business for Education program is that for me, the key word is family. Education has been my platform to learn about the world and succeed in my career. Um, my education started with my mother. She taught me to read when I was three years old at our home in the north of England. And a poor young single parent student, she didn't have much and we needed government support for me to go to school and for her to go on to train as a teacher. So many parents around the world in places like Sierra Leone don't have the options my mother had. No government support like the incredible Crianza Familia. Uh, no help to escape the cycle of poverty and illiteracy. This is an injustice. Every child deserves the platform that education offers, and every parent should be able to give their child the opportunity that my mum gave me. That's why I love Street Child's Family Business for Education program, because it empowers caregivers, gives them the opportunity to send their children to school and keep them there whilst building resilience. So I'm super excited and pleased that we've been recognized uh, for its impact and potential by a WISE Award for Innovations in Education. Thank you so much to the WISE team, to Her Highness, and the Qatar Foundation for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Tim, we saw your incredible work there from United World Schools. I mean, it's such a simple concept and yet so effective. Thank you and good afternoon. This award is dedicated to thousands of people who have played a vital role on the United World School's journey. And a defining moment was when we met a lady called Mingma Sherpa in Nepal about five years ago. Mingma works on the family farm uh, and is an extremely remote community. She has th three children. Her eldest daughter has never been to school. She can't read, write, or count. Her teenage son is required to help her on the family farm every day. And her youngest daughter is called Dakamu. And Dakamu, like 200 other children in the community, had no functioning school to attend. And if you're a nine-year-old illiterate girl in Nepal or Cambodia or Myanmar or many other remote parts of, of the world, your life opportunities don't look great. And Mingma knew this, and it's why she was so determined to work with us to develop a school for her daughter, for her family and for her community. Dakamu, her daughter, 
now goes to UWS Mude Community School. She's learned to read, write, and count, and she's shortly about to start at high school. She's the first person from her family to do so. Knowing we had the support of families like Ming Ma behind us, and now knowing we have the wise community behind us is absolutely inspirational, and together we'll continue to transform many thousands of lives through education. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Pooja, you're from the Arpan Personal Safety Programme. It was so moving to hear those children uh, talk about what they learned through your programme. Thank you, Qatar Foundation, for this honour. I'm really pleased to receive this award on behalf of Arpan. And what better day than 20th November 2019 that marks 30 years since the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child was adopted. And while some progress has been made, we have much more to do. I believe we need to look at education more holistically, integrate life skills into curriculum, and enhance the well-being of our children. This award reinstates my belief that education is a powerful tool for social change. The one defining moment in Arpan's journey came right at the beginning. I was watching a play that showed the trauma of an adult survivor who'd been sexually abused as a child by her uncle. I was shocked. I came out of that theater motivated to find out more. Preliminary research told me that in India, one in two children experience some form of sexual abuse. I was completely dumbfounded. This was unacceptable to me, and Arpan was born. We built an innovation school-based model to combine prevention and intervention work, and in the last 13 years, have impacted 1.2 million children and adults. This award is going to motivate us to reach out to many more millions of children and adults in India and across the world to create a safe world for our children. Shukran, Her Highness, Qatar, and Wise. Thank you, Pooja. And Elizabeth, uh, you're from the Akila Institute. You've empowered so many women. So I was actually 21 when I moved to Rwanda. And I was too naive to understand that traditional, exclusive higher education is not designed for students like the Aquila women or millions of other young people around the world. So over the past decade, Aquila graduates have proven that your place of birth or your socioeconomic status does not determine your aptitude or career success. Our graduates work in renewable energy, hydroponics, digital finance, drone delivery, industries that didn't even exist in Rwanda several years ago. One of our graduates, Sonia, is a software developer for Mara Phones, the first smartphone manufacturer on the continent. Our graduate, Evra, won the UN Climate Hackathon for building a mobile app that analyzes climate data for farmers. It is their success that drives me. The Aquila women have been my co-founders in designing a competency-based education model that combines the leadership and the technical skills needed for careers of the future. So together, we've reimagined the traditional higher ed business model. From facilities to student affairs, faculty structure to curriculum development, because we are obsessively focused on affordability and accessibility for students who otherwise wouldn't be in college. And we're now proud that we're, after 10 years, extending access to young men with the launch of our new co ed campus, Davis College. So over the coming decade, Davis College and the Aquila Institute will open 10 campuses across Africa and Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, and Hal from Microbit, um, extraordinary to see you teaching so many children coding. Yes, it's really a fun product. Uh, so on behalf of the Microbit team, I'd like to thank Her Highness and the Qatar Foundation, as well as all the staff at the, the WISE team as well as the millions of microbit educators and partners throughout the globe that are helping us inspire children to create their best digital future with microbit. And so I'd like to share one of those inspirational stories with you today. 
I was recently at a STEM expo very similar to the Doha Learning Days, teaching programming with a microbit. And just like you saw in the video, different kids reacted differently to the technology and to learning computing. But there's one girl in particular that really stood out at, to me. She's around nine years old, had not learned to code before, but was eager to learn and excited, but a little timid and hesitant around the technology. But within a few minutes, you could see her confidence level boost, just like the, the kids in the video, right? She was having fun, she was learning, and the next thing I know, she went from being a learner to then turning around and teaching other students at the expo how to program with the microbit. And so that's the spark that we really want to ignite in children, and girls especially, but all children, that in the digital age, this is now a foundational skill that all kids need to have access to, and that the technology can be empowering, and learning can be fun and exciting. Hal, thank you so much. Can I, can I now call on Dr. Asma Al-Fadala, Director of Research and Content Development from WISE, to come up on stage. Dr. Asma, thank you so much. Can I now call on Her Highness uh, Moza Bint Nasser, the chairperson of the Qatar Foundation, to come up on stage. Highness, thank you very much. And thank you and congratulations to all of you. And of course, if you want to hear more about these amazing stories, please attend the Hear My Story session in the Majlis tomorrow at 11 a.m. Now, I'm delighted to share with you that the call for applications for WISE Awards 2020 is officially opened. Of course, for more information, please visit the WISE website. Are you working on an education project that is transforming people's lives? Is it benefiting your community? Is it a model that can inspire others? 
Each year, the WISE Awards celebrate six groundbreaking education projects for their excellence and share them with the world. Apply for the 2020 WISE Awards. WISE, an initiative of Qatar Foundation. Okay, now to our next panel on how to create systematic change by scaling up innovative projects. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my panelists up onto the stage. Please take a seat. I'll uh, begin by introducing you. Um, first of all, Vicky Colbert. You're the founder and executive director of Escuela Nueva. Uh, we've got Aldo Di Pape, the founder of Teach Pitch and a former WISE accelerator. Uh, Nisha Ligon, the chief executive officer of Ubongo, and your organization, of course, won the WISE Awards in 2017. And Harun Yassin, you're the founder of Arenda, and your journey with us uh, here at WISE started on through WISE Learners Voice program. Uh, just to give uh, our audience a sense of what each of your organizations do, could I have you just briefly tell us about them? So just, just in a, a, about a minute 30. I'll begin with you, Vicky. Escuela Nueva, uh, Escuela Nueva, sure. Escuela, yeah. Yeah, Escuela yeah. Nueva means new school in Spanish. But contradictorily, it's one of the longest bottom-up innovations of the developing world that's still being sustained. It means new school. We just wanted to ensure quality learning for the most deprived, especially in the isolated rurals of Colombia. And we managed to put in practice in a very transform complexity to a very simple manageable action so that rural schools could perform and have results. And we've had proven results. And uh, not only it's, uh, it promotes self-paced learning, personalized learning, uh, cooperative learning, children are dialoguing all the time, and uh, no role of the teacher as a mentor, not just a transmitter of facts. So we started this so many years ago in Colombia and we wanted it to become a national policy. Um, and it did. So at this moment, Escuela Nueva is a national policy and has had proven results because where it's well implemented, these rural schools with very marginal children, marginated children, outperform urban schools, compensating for social inequality. So we have something that has been working for a long time and that's spread in many other countries. For example, the Vietnamese already took it to scale to their whole country. Brilliant. Aldo, uh, if you could tell us a little. Yeah, so we try to resolve the problem of information abundance, specifically for teachers. Uh, we believe that the very rapid growth of internet and technology has created uh, an, a very high influx of new educational information uh, becoming available in a very uh, rapid pace. Um, and uh, for that matter, the, the problem isn't anymore accessing high quality digital educational resources uh, uh, in terms of from an economic perspective. Uh, the, the problem has shifted from an economic perspective to a relevance perspective. So we are really focused on how to help teachers find the most relevant content at the right moment in time. So think of us as a very big search engine that brings currently together hundreds of thousands of resources from 200 uh, great learning platforms, digital learning platforms out there. Uh, we're being visited uh, uh, by over 35,000 subscribers today, growing with hundreds of new teachers who use our, our search engine each and every day. Disha. So Ubongo means brain in Kiswahili, and we are a Tanzania-based social enterprise that creates edutainment for kids in Africa uh, to help them learn and also to love learning. So we create educational cartoons and radio programs in a number of African languages, and we distribute them across 11 countries, free to children, uh, to watch and learn. Uh, we now have about 17 million kids who learn with us every month through our programs, uh, and we're working to scale these into many more contexts and languages so we can reach kids across the continent. Um, we have two shows right now, Akili and Me and Ubongo Kids, and these are multi-platform, and we really, uh, you know, 
try and reach children on whatever technology or platform it is that they can access with the goal of really equipping and empowering Africa's next generation with the foundational skills and the mindsets to create change in their own lives and their communities. And Harun? So I began my um, career as a teacher building schools and slum communities in Pakistan and realized very quickly that there was a huge lack of engagement from the part of the learners who came to the schools that we were building. Um, and so as a teacher, I came to the WISE Summit in 2014, and that's where the current company that I run was born. So very much WISE, born and bred. Um, and we met like-minded people over here at WISE with the question of, how do we really find what works in teaching and scale it to large populations of underserved children around Pakistan? Um, and that's where Talimabad, the product that we built, which is Urdu for City of Education, that's where it was born. Um, and it has now reached over 130,000 learners um, all across Pakistan and is expected to reach 1 million by next year. Amazing. I mean, you're relatively new in this, in this field, and as you say, it's only been four or five years since you began. And scaling up can actually be quite daunting. Just tell us about some of the challenges you faced. It's a, it's a nightmare, scaling up, uh, because one of the things, um, as a teacher, um, there are teachers in the crowd today, yes? Yes. Um, if, if you're a teacher and if you're, if you're in a classroom, you know the abundance of learning levels that all of your students have. So as a teacher, you have a wide spectrum of students who've got learning levels. But when you start to build a platform and the data of hundreds and thousands of students starts to come in, you start to realize um, that classrooms are in fact better in terms of diversity, but with all of these students, there's so much, there's such a vast amount of difference in how they learn and as a platform, when we were scaling up, we had a choice. We could choose to do the easy thing, which is basically broadcast one product to everyone, or the harder choice, which was how do we factor in the fact that every child is a unique learner, and every child has a unique pattern. And so building in that uniqueness, that personalized journey for every child is still a challenge, because it requires us as teachers building a platform without being in front of a child to look inside their brain, to see where they're struggling, to see where their difficulties are, and to build and teach them accordingly. So that's a huge challenge. And as we go to scale, I think that's one of the points where we think we'll struggle the most. The other thing is that I realized as we scale up a technology platform is that technology amplifies basically anything, even inequality. Uh, in the beginning, some of, as, as is with most technology products, most of our users used to come from the cities. And as we scaled up and users from rural areas started to use the product, we realized we'd built it all wrong because we'd built it keeping into mind the technology that people had in cities, whereas the reality looked much, much different. And again, we had a choice. Uh, the obvious business choice was if we remained in the cities, there would have been a greater amount of profit and they were, there was better technology available. But we chose to go to, to the rural areas um, and to build our product in such a way that low technology could sustain it over there as well. Vicky, I'll, I'll just pick up on what Harun was saying. I mean, scaling up is a nightmare. There are so many things that you have to think about and take into consideration, including accountability. Um, scaling up is a nightmare. But from the outset, you have to design your intervention or your innovation in such a way that it can be, that, that it's easily replicable and scalable. We want it from the outset to impact the national policy. And we did. But uh, we didn't have the technology at that time. And in rural isolated schools of Colombia, there's no connectivity. <laughs> so we used radio and other things at that time. Uh, but uh, I think the interesting thing is that we had to think first that anything we did had to be viable, technically speaking. You have to work with the rural teachers, and they don't have the PhDs mm -hmm. in the areas we work in. So it had to be viable, technically speaking that any teacher without having a PhD in the middle of isolated areas of Colombia could have results. Second, viable technically. Politically speaking, in Latin America we have strong teachers unions. So we, we had to get the teachers on board from the outset that they would be the actors of change. So we wanted to start, without technology at that time, a demand-driven approach from teachers. That they could go see something and say, we can do it. So viably, technically, politically, we had to get the teachers on board. 
because otherwise it's very difficult in Latin America, technically, politically, and financially. We had to think of really cost effectiveness and to make sure that the state could take it to scale, and we managed. So we impacted national policy, and then we, we started uh, scaling not only in Colombia, but other countries came in, especially from Latin America and, and, and other countries in Asia. As I mentioned, the Vietnamese already did. So we had to take those things in consideration. But in addition to that, there's a lot of literature. I had to th th uh, read David Corton from the US. You know, he analyzes to go to scale, you have to go through three stages. First, you have to learn to be effective, your first stage. You have to make sure that there's a fit between your intervention, your innovation, and that there's a fit and the beneficiaries. That there's a good fit. At this time, at this first stage, you need support fundings because you have to design materials, train teachers, train the trainer of the trainers, you know, have the whole, it's your most, uh, let's see, more, a little bit more expensive intervention. You learn to be effective. And then you learn to be efficient. Then you start having unitary costs come down when you start expanding. And then you're ready to scale. So we went through these stages. And this is why it's been one of the longest bottom-up innovations that's still being sustained. But what is interesting, it's still being demanded by the teachers. And that's what keeps it going. But what has been most interesting is to see it in other contexts, in other countries. We spread out in Latin America, uh, mainly through governments, mainly through governments, which I have a lot to say also. Uh, well, afterwards. We, we can pick up yes, on that. We can pick on that afterwards. Yes, uh, but these were the issues for scaling. For, for scaling. Uh, let's pick up on the issue of, uh, you know, because Vicky's works with governments, but uh, how about you? Um, uh, do, do you work much with governments or do you keep that quite separate? Uh, we do work with uh, larger organizations uh, close to governments, not with governments uh, directly. So, and, and we are only a technology, so I think the scaling effect is, is, is slightly easier. Uh, yet, in understanding your user, of course, you, you, there's a lot to, to be done, because, because getting it from one to 35,000 and counting is a, is a big exercise. And, and the way we went about it was really trying to understand our users as teachers. So what are teachers looking for? And, and, and we, we went basically with, with, you know, with the fact that a teacher is, of course, a teacher is an educator, but a teacher is also employed, and a teacher is constrained for time. And a teacher is, I mean, it's almost a global phenomenon that a teacher is underpaid. So, so the, 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 these two component, components of saving time and, and making a bit more money, earning an, an, an additional income, uh, basically led us to, to, to set out the formula for Teach Pitch, whereby we offer teachers the opportunity to, to find the most relevant, high-quality educational resources in the quickest way possible, but also because we now have this community going, the opportunity to train other teachers in uh, topics that are relevant for them. And often these topics turn out to be, again, uh, how to help their contemporaries resolve the, the problem of information abundance. So it's all technology skills, digital skills, project management, coding, uh, fake news, how to resolve that for your students, all these topics that, that really fit with a peer-to-peer -peer learning setting. So that's really something that, we, uh, you know, that we're now focused on and, that, and I'm happy to say is growing. But it took us a while, yes. Uh, can I just pick up on a point that's just been made about uh, technology and inequality and the fact that technology does highlight that? If I, if I can just get you, Aldo, to, to address that. I mean, did you come across these challenges yourself? Uh, yes, um, so, so basically we, we have users from over 205 countries and we have users from um, uh, em emerging markets um, uh, and developing countries as well as, as, as users from, from uh, uh, welfare economies. Um, they, they, they both use our system but in a different way. So for teachers who already have lots of resources available to them, um, the resources they find on our platform is, is basically in support of their professional development. So things like differentiation in the classroom, how to use technology in the classroom, anything, basically the curriculum is set, so they wouldn't necessarily use our system to find core curricular material. 
for teachers from in, 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 in developing countries, they use our system uh, uh, to find curricular content. So they, they're, they're a lot more focused on, on, on STEM, uh, um, uh, English, uh, kind of uh, those content. So we do see a different use of the, of, of the content that we offer by teachers from different countries. And, 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 but by, by making it open, by making basically the menu open and showing um, uh, you know, what your peer is using, because that's very visible on our platform, you inspire someone else. So it's, it's by searching and saving for it, so just an activity for yourself, you're already able to discover what another teacher likes, and that might lead you to inspire to use that as well. Nishan, mm -hmm. um, Ubongo, it, it, it reaches 11 countries uh, across uh, the continent of, of Africa. I mean, it's extraordinary what it's done. But just tell us about some of the, the challenges that you face scaling up Yes, yeah, so I mean, we, we are in many countries, but there's many more to go. There's 52 countries in Africa and 500 million children. So if we're saying we're reaching 17 million now, that's just a tiny percent of who we're trying to scale to reach. So we still feel that we're in, in the early stages of scale, but starting to um, really learn and test a lot of our assumptions as we go. So one of the biggest challenges we have is, of course, around language. We've got thousands of languages spoken in Africa and a huge amount of evidence that supports that learning in local language is what is best for young children. And so um, we are continually kind of trying to refine our model to make sure that we can create something that is simple enough and adaptable enough and yet still effective that we can take it to scale. So, um, you know, we challenge ourselves from the beginning to at least make our programs in two languages so that we knew that we have something that can be adapted from one language to another. Um, but now as we've gone to five languages this year and nine the next year, every new language brings up yet another kind of challenge or quirk that we have to overcome, especially when we're doing literacy, because B may be for baby and ball in English, but it's not going to be in other languages. So um, we've had to be really adaptable and learn as we go. Um, and we kind of have this iterative model where, you know, our product's never set or finished. We're continuing to ask ourselves these same questions as we scale, test the assumptions uh, around what's going to be effective, what's going to be engaging, and also what are the costs around it. So we're always trying to pay attention to, you know, the unit economics of what is the cost per child, um, both for reaching them and also the, you know, for each kind of standard deviation gain you're getting, how much do you need to spend? Because we really have to be able to understand that and drive it down even more if we're going to reach literally hundreds of millions of kids. And how are you doing that in terms of, are you working with local communities to have a better understanding of the cultural differences, for example, and, and reaching the multiple languages that exist? Yeah, so, so we design, we say that we co-create content uh, with kids and parents. So we involve kids really closely uh, in the progress. But I think we're also finding something that, that Sherry had said before, which is that um, you know a lot of things actually are universal, especially in early childhood. Um, just because a child is living in a rural village in Africa doesn't mean that they don't also love magic and fun and color and music. And so it's about identifying the elements of what is actually somewhat universal and we can use and then selectively localizing the things that um, need to be there to make it feel very locally relevant. And then I think the key is really figuring out how do we design together with kids and let kids lead the way. And we are actually finding that that works really well. We've created content with kids in Tanzania, which now gets you know over a million monthly viewers from the US and UK because um, you know, things that are, that really matter to children seem to matter all around and children want to connect with each other around the world too. So it's exciting to have something from Africa that can also scale elsewhere. Uh, so uh, can I just pick up on that? Because that's really fascinating. Are they in the local languages and the other kids, kids in the US and, and the UK are watching or is it in English? And how are they sort of, uh, you know, tell us about how they're relating to each other. So it started, we, I mean, we have English content too, and that's what really started to take off um, because I think as anyone from the US would know, there's huge issues of representation in media and education. Um, so, you know, African-American families 
sometimes have to look all the way to Africa to find more quality content, animated content that is representative. There's very few shows that um, would be including them. So it started there, but now there's an interesting move towards we have these families saying, now my kids are learning Swahili from your shows. So uh, it's kind of connecting that way in a different direction. That's really fascinating. Um, Haroon, I, I want to sort of better understand and pick up on uh, what Nishan said there about diversity in these communities, because if you're reaching so many different people, you would face very similar issues in Pakistan, because of course, uh, you know, Pakistan has so many diverse uh, communities and, and uh, tribes and groups and languages. There's two things about this. The first thing is I think um, with the large number of students that we now start to reach, often we run into the problem of native languages. There's um, a lot of languages that might be native to a child, but they might not be able to find content in that. And I think one of the things that we need to do immediately is to uh, build content and build platforms that are as close to the child's native language and their culture as possible. So that might be actually going against scale by trying to build specifically for every community. But I think that's, that's uh, something that every company and every initiative should be willing to do. Otherwise, we run the risk of alienating the children that we're trying to reach. But I mean, on the topic of diversity, sometimes when you're scaling, it's, it is a nightmare, but sometimes you run into some really ple pleasant um, surprises as well. We recently uh, got a call from a hospital, and they said, are you the folks from Talimabad? And we said, yes, why do you call? And if you're building a product for children, and if a hospital, a children's hospital calls, you've got to be worried. Um, but we ended up going there anyway and found out that there was a, there was a cancer ward of a children's hospital. And we'd built for out-of-school children, but we found out when we got there that these were children who had been admitted for cancer, and because of the chemotherapy treatment, they had dropped out of school. I never knew that myself. Um, and one of the children who'd been admitted brought our product in one day, and because he'd forgotten to turn off the volume, um, some of the other kids got on. And before long, the entire ward had caught on. And before long, the hospital had to clear out an entire room and put some screens and mobile phones in there so that the children could learn. And a lot of them sort of, uh, they have their chemotherapy during the day, and so they wake up and they're very active during the night. So they'll all get up and go to their room to study. And when they eventually ended up going back to school, their teachers asked them where they'd been learning from. Because as opposed to having regressed in their learning levels, they'd actually moved ahead. Um, and when the teachers found out, they started using it too. Um, and sometimes, sometimes there is, there is heartbreaking stuff in there too. I, 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 I met some children and I visited them a week later and they were no longer living. And I went and I complained to the hospital warden and I said, well, they just looked fine. What happened to them? And she told me that uh, they were just being children. And as we build and scale products, I think we forget as entrepreneurs, this was a reminder for me, that in scale, sometimes you hit these pockets where your product or your platform or your work can inspire the life or change the life of someone, uh, even if it's in its last days, in a way that you might not have ever intended. So 50 years from now, I would still be talking about this story of scale. I, I bet we'll have many more to come. That's really inspirational. I mean, on that, that's an incredibly inspirational story. I, I'm sure you've got uh, similar examples, Vicky, of, of uh, moments that have inspired you. Oh, yes, many, many moments, especially when you see uh, these rural children that come from these invisible schools, and just to see them outperform their urban schools, and, uh, you know, with, and compensating for social inequality, for equity. So this is wonderful when you start seeing the results. And um, when we scaled it up in now Colombia, and many Latin American countries came, we started sending Colombian teachers to many other countries, uh, to Mexico, to Brazil, everywhere. And uh, it was so interesting to see that it was very consistent, where it was well implemented, Escuela Noa was well implemented, which is really a totally child-centered intervention uh, for basic education. Um, it's amazing to see not only the results in outperforming urban schools, but also seeing that self-esteem. So when we started measuring so many years back, self-esteem of children, I mean, that's, that's, that's sufficient just to see that child will flourish immediately. And we've always measured self-esteem in all our projects. So I mean, these things are wonderful. And another thing that's wonderful 
is um, the impact of Escuela Nueva on peaceful social interaction of children coming out of Colombia. Mm. This is extremely important. But I also had to learn, I first had to publish it at the University of London so that then we could uh, accept it in accept Colombia. It. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the way it is. You, you need a lot of academic support so that people can believe what you're doing. You need evidence, you need proof. And when you want to scale up and impact national policies, you have to have measurement. And we've always had measurement behind. So just seeing children flourish from such, you know, the other day I was in an office and all of a sudden this gentleman came to me and said, I'm, I'm from the World Bank. And I said, really? And I, said, I was a student in Escuela Nueva. Yeah. <laughs> so this is just amazing to see how many children have flourished and have achieved so, so much. But we've been persistent and holding it from government and from civil society and private sector in Colombia. Aldo, it is about persistence, isn't it? Because it can be a, quite a frustrating process as well. Yeah, and uh, Vicky's story just reminded me that I'm in the presence of giants and of greats. So my hat's really off to you with such a story again. Um, uh, and and uh, it, it is about persistence. Yes, there is, there's a certain level of resilience of not wanting to give up. Um, uh, you, need to, you need to be able to put your teeth in a problem. Um, and, and really you need to, to kind of, you know, you know, make sure you, you, you understand the problem, you can approach the problem from every angle and be prepared to resolve it no matter what. And, and there are going to be uh, many setbacks. The, the funny thing is that a setback is not always a setback like, you know, something awful happening. It's sometimes doors that never open. Um, uh, and and, and you, you living with the hope that a door will open or that something will happen. Um, um, so and it, it's, it's, it's your own insecurity uh, around inaction. I think uh, we, we earlier with the we accelerator, we had a, um, a session on well-being, which was very interesting, whereby lots of social entrepreneurs, they have problems uh, uh, with self-care because they will feel guilty as soon as they do something which, 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 which might look like they will be better off themselves from that. So whether it's you know, doing sports or, 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 or keeping a journal or, or something like that, that all feels selfish. Um, so, so yeah, you need to you need to be you need to become one with the problem and being uh, really focused on trying to resolve that. Having said that, if you develop too much of a tunnel vision, you might close too many doors and you might stop listening, right? So, so and that, that's why I think in, in a platform like Wise is so amazing and, and 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 all the programs that are there, because that really allows us to listen to each other in the majlis and here and in all the sessions going on. Uh, it's really a kind of eye-opening uh, how many things are going on and, 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 and it gives you new ideas, it really re-energizes you. Do you think, Dishon, that you can become too big too quickly? Um, I, I think there's kind of, there, there's definitely a danger of trying to scale without um, also making sure that you're having impact and that you're scaling something effective. But I'm also starting to learn and think that maybe we've been thinking about this a little too linearly. Like I, I used to think, you know, it's all about you do a pilot and you get a proof of concept in that pilot and you evaluate it and that works and then you replicate it and you scale it. Um, but as we're growing, of course, there are new challenges and, and we're continually evolving, but we're actually also learning that maybe those things don't have a specific order. And instead of just thinking about how do you get impact at a small scale and scale that up, we also need to think about what is big and what's out there and how do we increase its impact and increase the depth of the impact that it's having. So, you know, with technology, there's so many platforms out there that are getting to students and getting to children, but maybe they're not having the greatest benefit. Um, so something big like that, there is a lot of potential for us to be partnering, um, you know, those of us who are in education, how do we actually look at what is already big and improve its impact? So I would actually say that it's just about looking at those things hand in hand, uh, not one than the other, but both trying to get things that are working at a small scale to a larger scale, but then also figuring out what's already out there and big, and how do we make that really effective and positive and impactful for learners. Uh, I have a very small foundation in Afghanistan, in Kabul, and um, it's to educate uh, girls, and they, they get uh, a scholarship to study at the American University of Afghanistan. My concern is that I want every dollar to go towards the girls, and I'm concerned about administrative costs, for example. 
this is something that you would all face because, you know, as you get bigger, uh, you need to bring on more people onto a team and then you're required to, you know, put money towards that. So just tell us, Haroon, about the challenges that you face there. I think as we grew our team, I was just uh, meeting some partners and telling them that when we started the work that we do, uh, we were a group of four people based out of a, a shed in the back of my house. Um, we barely paid ourselves anything. And we would proudly go into meetings and declare that we had zero overheads and we had none of that. And all of the money that we took would be going towards building our product. But as we started to grow, I think this is a lesson that we learned a bit too late because um, in the past few years, we began to lose people who'd been with us for about four, five, four, four years. Um, somebody had to get married, somebody had to have kids. Um, and as a result of that, um, I think one of the lessons that we're taking away with it is that if, if uh, innovations are going to scale, then people must scale with them too. Um, and people come with all of their needs and all of their requirements as well. And I think um, if we are to get to where we want to be in terms of building a model that reaches millions of students worldwide, then I think uh, it, it must be imperative that we invest in our team, and it must be imperative that we can sort of go to people like you and say, mm -hmm. well, it's, well, it's part of the overall picture, uh, very much so. And we won't be where we are without the people who um, do the work. Vicky, uh, just on that point, I mean, there are so many teachers and educators here, and also people who are sm starting off small and wanting to think about how they scale up. What advice can you give them about how they can take the steps, the initial steps, to grow? You definitely have to have results. You, I mean, in, in education, there are just so many wonderful ideas going on, but then there's a moment that, does it work? So you, for me, it's been, so, it's been my, my security blanket, always to have some type of evidence. And we gradually, we went gradually because we, it, Escuela Nueva is a national policy in Colombia, and uh, we've, we've now are, let's say, is how to maintain it and how to renovate it. Uh, but we needed to have evidence, and we did have to go through these stages. But once we had evidence in the first stage, when we wanted, let's say, the pilot type, um, then, of course, uh, the big players came into the picture, like the banks, Inter-American Bank and World Bank, and they started promoting it. They saw that there were results. So, um, so uh, many countries from Latin America and from Asia and Africa came to Colombia to see Escuela Nueva. So this was the expansion, international expansion. But definitely there was the moment when we wanted to impact the 20,000, the 34,000 rural schools in Colombia. Of course, there's a moment when you need the support, not of little projects, of little money, but the political decision of a World Bank loan or things like this. So in our case, we, it became a national policy and then we, we had a big impact in all Colombia. And when we did, we had evidence. We were the only two countries in Latin America. Uh, we received this first UNESCO study um, demonstrating that Colombia at that time was one of the only, Cuba and Colombia were the only two countries where rural schools outperformed urban schools. So this was enough to continue pushing it forward. And uh, so for us, we needed patience, a lot of patience, uh, persistence, but evidence. And, and Aldo, I mean, what, what would you suggest uh, is an effective business model when it comes to scaling up uh, an educational institute? Yeah, I mean, so, I think you need to look at uh, for people who who are starting an initiative, um, and and you know at a at uh, here at Wise when we're talking educational innovation, you need to allow yourself to genuinely uh, be a disruptor or an innovator first. So um, if you if you if you hey, if you want to make money in education, you can go with pathways that are already there, right? So so you can you could work for an educational publisher or set up a, a private school in, in China or I, I mean there are a variety of options that would allow you to 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 grow a business. That is different from really trying to innovate something, trying to build something, you know, tackling a real problem. And you need to give yourself a bit of time to genuinely understand. Uh, what it is that you're doing and the problem that you are resolving. I 100% agree that there needs to be evidence that you're making progress, but, but don't go too quick 
when it comes to, um, you know, if, if you want to build a business model, the business model will follow if there is a genuine uh, uh, innovation that you're bringing into this world. Um, uh, and, 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 and for that matter, to, to all stakeholders involved, from, from clients to investors, um, they also need to understand that you need a bit of time to grow your idea. And, and, and that what you are trying, the changes that you're trying to make are going to sustain and are going to remain there uh, uh, so that they can work together with you. Oh, we just have a few minutes uh, left. Um, so I wanted to just ask each of you the same question, which is the theme of, of our uh, summit here at WISE over the next couple of days. Um, if you can, each of you, in just one minute, tell us something that you have had to unlearn and then relearn uh, as an entrepreneur. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, uh, if I can begin with you, Nishan, is there something in your journey that you've had to unlearn and then, and then relearn? Honestly, I think everything I thought I knew about education and even what had worked out of my own education, um, I think that going on this journey has helped me really reevaluate, well, what is it you know, sometimes we think, oh, because I, I did this or I went to this school and I passed this test, that's what has, you know, led me to where I am now. And then you actually think back to, well, well what are the skills I use now and how did I develop those? And, and I think I've realized it was um, maybe things that were parallel to my education but weren't at the core of it. So, so we've been doing the same as we, as we work really closely with kids and um, start to understand their needs more, uh, we've, I've kind of unlearned everything I thought I knew. Yes, you need basic numeracy and literacy, but, but what is education and, and what is important for, um, for kids to learn? I, I'm relearning that now, and it's really exciting that the theme this year is um, about humanity and what it means to be human. We've actually kind of arrived on the same same concept from listening to kids. And so now our new season of our, our primary school show is themed around Utu, the Kiswahili word of humanity. Because what, what I'm unlearning and we're all relearning here is that that's what we really have to learn. It's not just about being able to pass a test. Thank you. And Harun? I think as a, as a teacher and as an entrepreneur, one thing that I've had to relearn is how to be a child. Uh, because I think w when you start to teach, there's a general notion that when you reach adulthood, that teachers must be stoic and that teachers must behave a certain way. But I found that the key to unlocking what is, what is it that excites children must mean that you must let go of some of your own preferences and, and, and be childlike with them. It means you, you, you must get equally excited when you see Sesame Street or, or any other thing that must excite a child because it is only when you see the world through their eyes and their lens that you start to build education that can really excite them. Um, I've met kids um, uh, who we've enrolled who, who've spent pretty much most of their lives on the streets. And when we've enrolled them, I've found that rational thinking, the, the, the thought that you need to be in school because it's good for you, really works. Instead, what works is what makes you a child at heart and how, how must we get to it together? And from, for that, I think the entrepreneur, I think evidence definitely plays a role, but I think for that, an entrepreneur must begin with a really sort of emotional journey back to childhood. Thank you, Harun. And Vicky, I'll uh, just get a quick word from you about that as well. I guess in, 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 two, in two dimensions. Uh, I, I learned during this process that when you start just working with, with the curriculum, the national curriculums, you end up transforming this and working with the leadership skills and with uh, uh, the 21st century skills. So all of a sudden I started seeing it's more important what they're doing. They're learning to learn. They're learning to take decisions by themselves. They're learning to lead processes, leadership. Uh, they're learning beyond just traditional curriculum, and they're learning the ability to work in teams. So I think this is the most, for us, it's crucial because it's one of our strengths. But the other thing I have learned, let's say more from the political and the macro picture, is I've worked a lot through governments. Uh, when, when the World Bank came and said, we, you know, we want to expand this and take it to many other countries, um, uh, I mainly work through governments, and you have to work with governments. That's the responsibility, that is the role, but you cannot leave them alone. Governments are great for having big impact and coverage. That's their responsibility. But you need two, two key words for 
where you bring in uh, public-private partnerships and the role of civil society for two key words, quality and sustainability. So you need governments for scaling, you need governments for big impact, but you need the partnership with civil society and public sector for quality and sustainability. And Aldo. Yeah, I think I generally needed to relearn what listening is because I thought I was listening, but I, w I really wasn't. Um, so, so, uh, uh, we had, so, so with the users, uh, you know, a teacher has many problems, and I, I, I genuinely needed to train myself to listen what those problems were, how systemic these problems were. And, 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 and I had the tendency to, to hear a problem and then right away build a solution, say, oh, this is gonna help you, and then it didn't work. And then, you know, and you try that a variety of times, and it doesn't work. And then I thought, well, hold on, I'm not listening. I'm not listening to this variety of factors that are basically troubling you. Uh, uh, so, so only by truly listening, I could give a solution. So that's what I had to relearn. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank you all for joining us here for this session. Vicky, Aldo, Nishon, and Haru. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Haroon. And thank you to you all for such a rich conversation throughout the day. I invite you to continue to have these conversations online and in person. I'd like to remind you all that the shuttles will pick you up tomorrow morning at 7.45 a.m. sharp. I'd also like to remind you to remember to leave your headsets um, before you leave the theater. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. for a session by Education Above All on how to reach out of school children. Have a fantastic evening. <laughs>